So we are going to continue working through our series in the book of Acts. And uh, the very beginning of this book, as many of you already are aware, Jesus is about to ascend to heaven. And uh, before he does that, he gives his disciples a command. He commissions them to go and to make disciples of the nations. He says to be his witnesses to Jerusalem and to Judea, Samaria, and then ultimately to the ends of the earth. And so through this book, we've seen the disciples being faithful to that commission, where they have now preached Christ and lived out the Christian life in Jerusalem. We see that they've established churches, that they've gone to Judea. They've seen uh, missionaries like Philip going to Samaria. And now we've been seeing the last few chapters how now it's all ultimately going to the Gentiles now. We see Cornelius' house, the Holy Spirit being poured out on Gentiles. We see it going beyond that, and we see that other Gentiles in Antioch and, and churches being set up there. So we see Christ is being preached, and the, the kingdom is expanding throughout the world. But as we've seen through this book, we also notice that as the church is faithful to the commission, as they preach Christ, we also see that there seems to be an ongoing intensification of persecution, right? As we see that we continue to grow in our faithfulness, we we also see that the world grows in its hostility towards the church. And so that's what we're going to be seeing once again here in in chapter 12. And like I said, you can almost see like an ongoing pattern here. It's like you see them preach the word, and then you see them get imprisoned, right? We've already seen Peter and John and some others imprisoned already multiple times in this book so far. But so what we see at the beginning, it seems that this uh, persecution is is unlike what we have seen before, because it says that King Herod, which he's basically one of the puppet kings, right, below the Roman um, army, the Roman government, right? And basically he would be like the king that would kind of preside over the Jews, right? And there's multiple Herods that we've seen, and none of them are good guys, right? We see Herod um, trying to kill the innocents when Jesus is born. We see another Herod um, getting John the Baptist killed. And now we see another Herod here who is persecuting the church. And it says that what he does is he he harasses some from the church by stretching out his hand. But then it also says that he kills James, the brother of John, with the sword. So James, the brother of John, that is one of the sons of Zebedee. So if you've heard of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were one of the fishermen that were called um, when you had the four fishermen being called to be one of the twelve. So this is the first time in all of scripture that we see one of the twelve apostles who walked with Jesus on the earth physically, where we actually see them now dying for the faith. So this is James, the brother of John, so John, the one who wrote the Gospel of John, who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, wrote Revelation. It's his brother, right? So it's James the Greater. He is the one here who is killed by the sword. Now, most likely this is a beheading. Uh, usually if you were killed by a sword, that would have been um, to um, cut off the head. And so we see that he is, he is killed. He's martyred for the faith because of this. But then it goes on. It says that the Jews loved this because we know that many of the Jews didn't like the Christians, right? We, we saw Saul of Tarsus was a, a Pharisee, a Jew, who, who didn't like the Christians and was persecuting the church. Well, it's, it says that Herod sees the response of the Jews, that they are, they are thrilled that they killed one of the 12, right? One of the big guys. And it says because it thrilled them so much that he decided, you know what, I'm going to continue the persecution, and I'm going to actually get now the, the real top guy. I'm going to get Peter, right? Simon Peter, one of the spokesmen, right? He kind of was the, 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 the talkative one of the group, right? He was the one that preached the main sermon at Pentecost. He's the one, there's been rumors that if his shadow would just pass you, you would be healed. So he's thinking, all right, now we're going to get Peter. And so what they do is they imprison him. But Herod probably knew of what has happened in the past, where they've been imprisoned and they escaped. So what he does, he actually puts four squads of soldiers on Peter. And it actually says that he's in between two of them in prison. And it says that he's chained in his hand. So it's probably that he's being chained to each soldier. So literally, if he's going somewhere, he's going with two soldiers. And even if you were to kill or knock out one soldier, you're not going to get very far because you'd be having to drag a soldier, right? And so there's probably two that were in the cell with him, chained to him, and there was probably others that were on the outside that he would have to pass through, even if he got somehow away from these two. So we see that Peter is in prison now, and James, the brother of John, has just been martyred. And then it says that the church, however, has been in constant prayer. They've been in constant prayer 
for the persecution, what's going on there, for Peter, who's in prison. And it says that one night, while he's in prison, he falls asleep, Peter's asleep, and God sends an angel. The angel, it says, it comes into the cell, light is shown, and he strikes Peter. He says, get up, get your stuff, get dressed, gird yourself, we're going. And it says immediately, these chains, they fall off his hands, they start to walk through, they're passing all these military checkpoints, and they even get to this big iron gate, and it says that the gate just flings open without anybody touching it, and then immediately at that point, Peter's looking around, and he, he's actually been trying to come to himself, he just woke up, and he thought it was actually a vision, he didn't know what was happening was real here, and all of a sudden the angel disappears, and he's on his own, the gate's open, he's freed from his chains, and he's like, this was, God really just did this. Which is so funny, too, by the way, because he's already been freed twice, at least, before this. So, but anyway, but he, he's, coming, he's coming to, he's realizing what's happening. He's like, I need to go let the brothers and sisters in Christ know what, what just happened. So what he does is he goes to one of the, probably the bigger house churches, because at this time, a lot of these churches would be meeting in homes, and usually it would go to some people that were more well-off in the church, so those who could host bigger gatherings. And so he goes to um, John Mark's mother's house. So John Mark, as some of you know, he is a uh, traveling companion who goes and does missionary work with um, Paul and Barnabas, and there's actually an issue where John Mark actually um, walks away um, from the missionary work and actually causes some tension between Paul and Barnabas later, but it's his mother's home, and it says that at night, so by the way, Peter was just asleep. It says he goes to the house, and they are at the house at that moment praying still. So they're still petitioning God, praying for the church, praying for Peter probably to be freed or to be comforted, to have peace. And so he knocks on the door now, and it says that there's a servant girl named Rhoda that comes up. And so she comes, and she hears Peter's voice saying, hey, it's me. Let me in. And it says that she's overjoyed. She's like, she can't believe that it just happened. And so she goes and she goes and runs and tells all the people that are praying for Peter. He's like, Peter's outside. And they basically say, like, no, you're crazy. You're, you're beside yourself. And then she keeps saying, no, no, really. He's right outside. And then they're like, no, maybe it's his angel. So there's, there's an ongoing belief at this time, especially that there are like these guardian angels that may have even resembled those that they represented. So they were thinking, well, it couldn't have been Peter, but it probably was just his angel. Like that's the more logical belief that it's his angel that's outside knocking on the door. But finally, they say, all right, let's go see what Rhoda heard or saw. They open it and then they're astonished. Peter is there. The prayer request has been answered. So then he goes and he lets them know everything that just happened, how God has freed them with an, or freed them with an angel, and how um, he's been working, and all these different things going on. And he says, now go tell James. Now this isn't James, the one who was martyred. This is James the Just, or also known as Jesus' brother James, who became one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. So he says, go tell James and the other brothers, let them know what I just told you. Because Peter knows he can't stay in this area, because if he isn't on the move, he's going to be captured most likely. So he lets them know what happens. He goes on. And then it goes back and zooms in at the end of this chapter on focusing back on Herod, his response. And so Herod, wicked guy, comes, finds that Peter's not there, doesn't get to kill him like he had been hoping, planning, plotting. And so what he does is he kills the guards, which that's not very uncommon a lot of times, especially when you have wicked kings, whenever the, the, the guards are not able to keep their prisoner they usually will kill them because that's their punishment, the punishment that was meant for the, the criminal. And so he kills all these guards, these soldiers, and then it goes on and explains just something else that happens with Herod, where he's upset with Tyre and Sidon, which are, these are some other local regions, and somehow there's some political connections there, and he's ticked off with them. But somehow they're trying to get in Herod's good graces again. And so what happens is he has this big event where these different representatives come, and he gets all dressed up in this super fancy garment, and he comes, sits on his little throne, and has all these people around, and he starts to give these orations, or these oracles, these, this, this proclamation. He starts to, to speak to them um, very eloquently. And so because of that, and some of the people trying to get in his good graces, they all start to praise him. And they're like, wow, he's amazing. Herod, he's the great king. And it's like the voice of a god. So they're giving him all the praise. They're giving him all the glory. And then immediately it says that an angel then, possibly even the same angel, comes, strikes Herod. He bends over, and it says that he ends up dying and becomes worm food. So that's what happens to Herod. So we see then with this persecution at the beginning of chapter 12, we see that the ending result is Herod dies 
And then if you look at the very end of this, it says, and what happens? It says that the word of God continues on. It says in verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. So that's the ending result here of this persecution. So as we think about this event, as we think about persecution, as we, as we think about prayer, the first thing that I really want to just draw your attention to in verses 1 to 4 is I think we have to remember this call for Christians, which is to die to self. Following Christ means dying to yourself and living for him. This is a verse that I, I very often quote here in Luke 9, verses 23 to 24. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. See, Jesus, when he calls us to follow him, when he calls us to be on mission, to be commissioned, to go, therefore, to be his witnesses, he says to truly follow me, it means that you must deny yourself. You must die to yourself. That means your, your old life, you must give up. It's all for Christ. That's why when Paul is talking, he says to live is Christ. To die is gain. He's saying to live. That means my entire life is to be all at Christ's expense. Whatever Christ wants me to do, I'm going to go do. And I'm sharing this with you because this is something that was heavy on my heart when we were on this recent mission in Acuna. And I shared a devotion that was kind of catered to this, um, this um, text where we see that the Christian life, it, it calls us to radical abandonment of our comforts and our agendas. See, I was going on this trip, and, and as I was uh, you know, packing it, and I was about to say bye to my wife, I was thinking more and more about how I need to hear this command to die to self. Because as I was getting ready, I was thinking, I really don't want to leave my wife. I really don't want to not be with my child. I really don't want to leave my comfy bed, my house, where I can do whatever I want with my television, my entertainment, my things, right? I don't want to have to go to a place where they're going to give me food that I know I'm not going to like. I can't just order pizza every night because I like pizza, right? I have to forsake some of my comforts and pleasures, and I realize how often I don't want to do that myself. But Jesus goes beyond what he just says in dying or taking up your cross, denying yourself in Luke 9. He continues, actually. He goes even further. In Luke 9, 57 to 62, listen to this radical abandonment that he is calling us to as disciples. He says, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Think how radical what Jesus is saying to be a disciple, to follow him. You really have to die to self. He's saying, if you're going to follow me, you must be willing to be homeless. The Son of Man didn't have a place to lay his head at night. Are you willing to be homeless for Christ? Are you willing to give up that comfort? It says that you must go, and it says that you can't bury your father. Now, that's a pretty intimate time if your father just died, or a loved one just died, and Jesus says, no, I want you to go here and follow me. Are you willing to do that? Or are you saying, no, 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 my, my family's more important than, than Jesus? Or this last one saying, well, let me just go say bye to my family or those in my house before I go and follow you, and he says, no one's fit if they're going to have their head looking back as they're pushing the plow. You're not fit for the kingdom of God. Our relationship to Christ is first in all things. We must be willing to die to ourselves, die to the passions, the pleasures of the world, give up our comfort and give up our agendas, our plans. We have to say, Jesus, wherever you go, I'm going. 
Can you say that? Because here we see in the text disciples doing that. Some people can't even get up on a Sunday morning to come to church, and they're saying, yeah, I would follow Jesus wherever he goes, except for Sunday morning because it's a little too early. Except on a Wednesday night because, you know, I already did Sunday thing. I'm never going to go on a mission trip because, you know, Jesus would never call me to that. Or I know there are needs in, the, in, the, in our church locally right now with different ministries going on, but I don't feel called to that area. Here's the thing. If Jesus says there's a need here in the church, you're probably getting called to that area if you can do it, right? See, we all say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus to the ends of the earth, proclaiming, living it out, until there's certain needs that, oh, I'm a little uncomfortable. I don't want to do that, you know? Oh, my agenda is actually this way, Jesus. Are you willing to die to self? That's how a church is effective, when we are giving up our passions, our comforts, our agendas. Die to self, because here we see James and Peter doing that. They were not comfy. Does anyone want to go and get beheaded? Does anyone want to go sleep in a prison cell for the third time, chained to soldiers who hate you and are prejudiced against you, probably been beaten severely beforehand? That's not comfy. That's the Christian life. The Christian life is saying, I will follow Jesus even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's difficult. And you might ask yourself, well, why would we do this? Well, time and time again, we see that the sacrifice is worth it. Following Christ is worth it. He is the greatest treasure we could possibly imagine. He is the one that can give us comfort and peace even through uncomfortable, unpeaceful situations. And Jesus Not only does he call us to die to ourselves, but we see in the gospel, he died for you. Jesus loves you enough to die for you. He lived his entire life in sacrifice. Sacrifice for you. He gave up being in a comfy place in heaven to come and to be dead and suffer and and to be punished and to be mocked for you. Are you willing to show that type of commitment, that type of love? Because we see James and Peter, they loved the Lord, they suffered for the Lord, they died to their self. And I think we as the church, when we, especially in our Western context, we can get so caught up in being comfy in all my needs. But we have to always say, what does God want? What does Jesus want? Now, he might not always call you to go to another country. He might not call you to die for the faith. But he does call all of us to die to self. And I think we need to hear that And we need to be reminded of that time and time again. Are we willing to give it up? Because like I said, this was going on in my heart while I was in Mexico. Because we were looking in certain parts in the ghetto areas and the places that were not very well kept and were kind of, you know, not very clean at certain times. And I was thinking to myself, if God said, I want you to stay here. I want you to move here. I don't think my heart was ready to say, yes, Lord. I was like, no, I really want to go and be back in the comforts of the West, you know, or the the U.S. And I have to ask, are we willing to do that? Whenever God says go, God says follow me, are we saying yes, Lord? So that's the first thing. We have to be willing to die to self regardless of what that looks like. The next thing I think we see from this is that we are to believe in prayer. In this text, we see that God sees our trials and he hears our prayers. And I want to read from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, and I think really this simple verse, it really kind of just summarizes this chapter for us, I think. It says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So what we see here is we see that it says his eyes are on the righteous, so he sees us, those who are following him, seeking to obey him. And he says his ears, they are open to their prayers. So that means he will hear us when we, when we cry out to him, when we pray to him, when we petition him. He, he not only sees, he hears. And then it says, but his face of the Lord, it's against those who do evil. So those like Herod. And we see at the end, that's exactly what happens to Herod. God opposes Herod. So I think this kind of summarizes nicely for us. But I think within it, we have to be reminded that we must believe that God sees us. We must believe that God really hears us, that we're not just saying a a simple prayer and we just don't think we're speaking to the wind, right? We are actually talking to the king of kings. We are talking to the Lord of heaven, 
on his throne, saying he sees you, saying he hears you every single time. Because I love it, the church here is described as not abandoning their commitment to prayer. It says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Remember, James has already been killed. And they were probably praying for James, too. James got killed, and they didn't get the, the, what they were asking for, probably, right? But it says they continued to believe in prayer. They continued to petition and trust God. And I think we have to be like that. Sometimes we feel like maybe God's not hearing us when we pray. But we have to remember that God hears our prayers. But I think it's so interesting that we see that it says that they constantly were praying to God for Peter, right? And it says that when Peter was later freed, it says that they were still in prayer at the house. But if you recognize that you're hearing that they're praying, but then you also notice that they didn't really expect God to answer their prayers. That's the funny part in this, if you notice, how, how it says twice that they're, they're committed to prayer, right? But it says that when Peter was out being freed, walking with the angel, it says that he didn't think it was real. Well, why wouldn't you think it's real, Peter? God's already done it twice. You know everything Jesus has done in his ministry. You've been praying to God, asking God to free you, to, to, to be with you, right, to lead you. Why would you not? Why would you not think it's real? Why would there be any doubt that it's real? But likewise, whenever Peter's knocking on the door, what is the church saying to Rhoda, the poor servant that's just saying, hey, he's right here. You are beside yourself. You're crazy. You think that our prayer really is going to get Peter here? Or likewise, no, it is an angel. Our prayers didn't really get answered. It's an angel, not Peter. Think about that. The answer to their prayer request is at the door, and they're not willing to open the door. Are you like that sometimes? Where you're committed to prayer, you're praying regularly, but you don't really expect God to work. You're not really believing in the power of prayer. And I love that we see that even though their faith was weak, even though that they were praying, we see that God graciously honors even the weakest faith, doesn't he? Like I said, Peter's there, they prayed for it, but you can tell that there's still some doubt. There's still some weak faith in the body. Now, how, how much more would God do if we truly trusted him, if we truly believed in prayer? We need to pray with expectation because we see time and time again through this book, as well as others, that when we pray, when the church prays, God works. God responds. God acts. There are things that happen when we get on our knees. I'll tell you right now, the enemy does not want you to pray to God. He wants you to think, no, prayer is just, like I said, just talking to the wind. He doesn't want you to think it's effective because he knows what happens if we don't pray. But when we pray, things happen. Are you someone that is praying to God regularly? Are you praying without ceasing, as the text says? And not only are you praying, but are you actually expecting? Pray with persistence and expect God to respond. Because we actually see, I think, in the text, that God will answer every single prayer. Did you know that? God will answer every single prayer. John 14, 13 to 14, it says, and whatever you ask in my name, this is Jesus speaking, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. What Jesus is saying here is that when we ask something in his will, in his name, we are promised a response. God will give us an answer to our prayer. Now, that doesn't always mean God will say yes. God is not always going to say, oh, you prayed for it, here's your new car. You prayed for it, here's your nice house, right? That's not what it means. But it does say God will hear you, and if it's within his will, it's going to be done. So that means if you prayed for something and it didn't happen, guess what that means? It wasn't in his will. Jesus even prayed to God in the garden saying, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. You know what God said? It's not my will. You need to drink this cup. See, 
God the Father said no to Jesus in that request, and Jesus trusted that response. We have to be like that. When we pray to God, we expect him to give us an answer. We expect him to work, but sometimes it's not going to be the way that we are looking for it, right? We don't know why God said no to James and we said yes to Peter. We don't know that. But we are to believe in prayer and we are to trust in the sovereign work of the Lord. He knows why he's answering certain prayers in a specific way and others in another But we see that when they prayed, what happens is it enabled Peter to find peace while imprisoned, and it freed him from his chains. Did you notice that? In the text, it says that Peter was in prison, chained to soldiers, knowing his brother that had already been martyred for the faith, and most likely was looking like he was going to be next. And it says that he is asleep. Not only that, but it says that the angel didn't say, hey, Peter, time to get up. He said, it struck him. He probably hit him pretty hard. He was sound asleep. How do you have that type of peace when you're at, if I was about to die tomorrow and I had people hating me and beating me, I probably wouldn't sleep very well. I'll tell you that. Peter's sound asleep. Why? Because the church has been praying for him. What do we see in Philippians? This um, common verse that is quoted, uh, Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then what? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The church was praying to God for Peter, and Peter was able to get a good night's sleep while in a terrible situation. But then we also see that he's also freed. The chains fall off. Think about that. He was chained, but prayer was loosed. When we unleash our prayers, we can free people. We can do things for those who are suffering. And actually in Hebrews 13.3, I think it's so important that we note this. Is it says, remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. I think we have to remember that this isn't just a story 2,000 years ago. There are brothers and sisters in Christ right now in prison. Not just here in the West, but all over the globe for their faith, they are imprisoned. They are suffering. And I think we need to pray for them. And I want to do that together as a body right now, just a short prayer to remember our brothers and sisters who are suffering. We need to pray for them. The Bible commands it. So let us pray for these brothers and sisters Father, we lift our brothers and sisters up to you, knowing that the body of Christ is not just here in Carterville, but all over the world, there are those who are suffering that they might be seeing death today or tomorrow, or they may have seen their loved ones already perish, die for the faith, because they were willing to die to self. So Lord, we pray a blessing over all of our brothers and sisters suffering, that you would give them that peace that Peter found in that prison. Comfort, contentment, knowing you are with them, that you love them. And Lord, we also ask, Lord, would you work? Would you do a miracle? Would you open the door, open the gate, loose the chains? Would you do something for these people? Let them know that you were there, that you love them. We trust you, Lord, whatever your will is for this situation. But we lift up our brothers and sisters. We do not forget them. We mourn for those who mourn. So, Lord, be with them. Give them peace and comfort. Let them lean on you, trust in you, and work miracles in their lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. One final thing I want to mention on prayer is that there is one prayer that we know that God will always say yes to. So there are prayers that God's going to hear all of our prayers. Sometimes he's going to say yes, sometimes he'll say later, sometimes he'll say no. But there's one prayer he's always going to say yes to. You know what it is? Forgive me. Save me. So you think the symbolism of Peter being freed from the chains of the prison cell is a symbol for the gospel. That prayer. Lord, I hear that you are the Lord, that you are the Savior of the world, that you died for my sins. I am going to repent and trust in you. Will you save me? Jesus will say yes. If your heart is sincerely praying that prayer, if you really desire it, the answer will always be yes. 
Jesus came to save. He came to free you from your prison cell of sin, of death, of the world. He will free you. Believe in that prayer. Expect God to work. Expect God to respond. Be looking to see what he has for you, what, what his will is in our prayer life, in our relationship with him. So I think we are to die to self. We are to believe in prayer. The final thing I want to leave you all with is we are to give glory to God alone. In verses 18 to 25, we see the ending of the story with the character Herod. And it says that he himself did not give glory to God. That was the issue. He was seeking for himself glory. He put on the fancy robe. He sat on the throne. He gave his speech. He, the, the crowd loves him, praises him, says amazing things, says, you're just like God. Your voice is the voice of a God. And we see because of that what happens. It says that he dies, he becomes worm food, and that is because in Isaiah 42, 8, we, we are told that God will not share his glory with another. There are people that we know, maybe ourselves who are re refusing to die to self, that we are trying to rob God of his glory, that we want the glory for ourselves. We have to remember, you cannot give God glory if you are seeking it for yourself. You're either going to praise or you're going to be asking for the praise, right? We cannot give ourselves the glory. You cannot give God glory and seek it for yourself. In fact, for those who seek to elevate themselves, what does the text in Matthew 23, 12 say? It says, God exalts the humble and humbles the proud. It says, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's exactly what happens with Herod here. He exalted himself, and he was humbled by God. Do you want to be that person that says, I'm not dying to self. I'm going to elevate, exalt myself. I'm going to get the glory. It's about me, my desires, my wants, my throne. You're going to be humbled by the God Almighty. I don't want to be humbled by the God Almighty. I would much rather humble myself and then let him decide what he wants for me. Humble yourself before the Lord. Because here we see that he dies, he's killed, he is humbled because he is trying to rob God of his rightful praise and worship. But at the very end it says, but the word of God continued to grow and multiply. We see the ongoing progress reports in the, in the book of Acts. The word of God continued to grow and multiplied. God's glory continued to be praised. God's glory was never going to be robbed. So we have to choose, are we going to be like Herod or like the disciples? Are we going to die to self? Are we going to believe in prayer? And are we going to give glory to God? Because that's what we're called to. I hope that we hear this, that we do these things, and that we trust that God will work it all out. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful, Lord, for this time to, to engage your word, Lord, to hear these important truths, Lord, the reminder to die to self, to give it up, whatever it is, Lord, that we are holding on to and saying that it's not, we're not willing to give it to you. Let us die to our own agendas. Lord, let us believe in prayer. Let us trust that when we talk to you, that you listen, that you hear us, that you're willing to respond and do amazing things, Lord, for the kingdom. And ultimately, let us always give you glory. Let us praise you for loving us, for sending your son to die for us, that he rose from the dead and offers us your kingdom and, and a family to be a part of, Lord. We thank you for your love, for your kindness. Let us serve you. Let us follow you faithfully. Let us go and be your witnesses to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.